Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Jill Jividen, and I'm the Manager of Research Development Support in the Med School Office of Research. Um, one of my jobs is to uh, develop and implement resources that help faculty get their research funding. And I started this position about two years ago, and the idea for this communications workshop has been gestating for almost all of that time, and uh, only came to fruition with the uh, amazing help of um, our marketing and communications team, Amy Kaffenberger, who was just here. I don't know if she's still here. Uh, and then uh, Morgan Hayward, who just came on board this summer, um, who really helped shape this and uh, get our dates on the calendar and help promote it. And we've had an outstanding response uh, for this series of um, communication workshops. Uh, the goal of these workshops is to uh, help faculty and postdocs and students uh, think about their online reputations. Uh, we have a vested interest now more than ever in communicating the important work we do to the public. Um, I don't know how many of you, if you've heard of Andy Barowitz or um, follow him online, he's the John Stewart of The New Yorker, he does satire. And one of these articles that keeps popping up over and over is something about, I forget the headline exactly, but something about uh, the earth has become infested with a new strain of fact-resistant humans. And I, I love that because uh, it sort of illustrates why we have to um, do better about communicating the impact of, of uh, research, of our science. And um, so the purpose of this is to uh, help faculty communicate that science better, uh, to know what channels to use um, later on in other workshops uh, about using uh, social media effectively, about using visualization effectively. Uh, later on, I'm teaching a plain language workshop uh, that's very hands-on. Those are filling up very quickly, and I will do more of those workshops if there's a, a demand for it. Uh, that talks about putting your very complicated ideas in plain language so that um, the broader population can understand what it is, what it is you're doing. And um, this is toward uh, not only getting the word out, but helping you build your reputations as researchers, too. Uh, because uh, the bottom line for me is about bringing in research funding. Uh, the idea behind this, especially as uh, things like alternative metrics gain uh, some uh, footing with sponsors, and by alternative metrics, I'm talking about things like how often your papers are tweeted, um, how often you're read in Mendeley, um, your presence on ResearchGate and uh, Facebook and things like that. Um, and those things are starting to gain traction. And so we want to teach you how to use those things to your advantage so that maybe by the time your proposals get to review committee to study section, uh, maybe there is already some kind of name recognition. Maybe they already know a little bit about the important work you're doing. So those are the things that, uh, or my reasons for bringing this uh, series to you. And um, I hope that you will contact us in the Office of Research if you want to find out more about the uh, services that we provide. And uh, I'm going to introduce Kara Gavin, who is always an excellent presenter and has wonderful information for you. She is with the communications team with the uh, health system and uh, the director of communications for the Institute of Healthcare Policy and Innovation. She's going to talk to you about uh, public relations in the health sciences and how to communicate with external audiences. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. This is so great to see a great crowd and to hear that the sign up went so well. And thank you for coming. So, I uh, want to start with just letting you know that I really appreciate questions at any time. So, please don't wait till the end, but I do want to leave a lot of time for questions. So, I'll try and power through my slides. Um, I hope everyone got a packet because there's a lot of stuff in the packet that will help you after this workshop take this back and actually act on it, I hope. Uh, and I'm also available anytime by email um, and phone. So my title today, I, I kind of um, played around with the title from what was on the, on the actual advertisement, is Only Connect. And, and, I, and I use that with apologies to E.M. Forster, who is a famous author, because his, uh, in one of his books, his famous books, Howard the End, uh, this phrase of only connect and, and connecting in this case, uh, the pros and the passion. This idea of connecting, in this case, what we're going to be talking about is connecting the research world with the public world and trying to do that uh, in ways that are taking advantage of all the new technologies that are out there. So I love the enforcer. I love Howard's End the movie. So I just figured I'd throw this in there. But think about the connecting idea throughout this. So basically, as Bill said, I'm uh, part of the Department of Communication for the whole health system. That's the med school, the hospital, the whole nine yards. So I work for you. And I have been here about 17 years. Uh, before that, I was at Brookhaven National Lab in uh, New York. 
I have a bachelor's in biology and journalism and science writing and a master's in journalism with a science writing concentration. So I trained to do this. And I have been very fortunate to be able to do this for uh, more than 20 years. So basically what I do is I find and tell stories from throughout the health system, throughout the research environment mostly now. Previously I did a lot more of the clinical world, but I'm also an interface with reporters uh, who are looking for sources and experts inside that world. So it's my job to know who I can call on when a reporter is looking for someone. And the idea in, in my field now in the last uh, 10 years or so is that we spend a lot of our time figuring out how to get stories out in any possible way we can. So why does U of M have people like me? And there are about 15 people roughly like me around this university between the hospitals and the medical school and the rest of campus. Please welcome and take a packet up front, thanks. Um, because we know that people care about science and we know that your work should be reaching the people who care about it. And we know that your work should be having as much impact as it can. Why do it on this? But we also know that we're a publicly funded university. And we know that the research grants that you all are operating on are publicly funded and from taxpayers. And so we owe them, uh, I would argue, a debt of paying it back and saying, here's what we've done with the money that you gave us 10 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, a year ago, and explaining it in ways that they can understand because most Americans do need science and medicine translated for them at some level. And frankly, in the last 10 years, it has become easier and easier than ever to get information out from institutions like ours to the public. When I started in this field, it was entirely moderated through the news media. It was all about getting reporters to, to pick up the phone or open your fax or your mail um, and, and take, you know, take a moment and say, yeah, that's an interesting piece of research. I think I'll do a story. Now it's about that too. There are fewer reporters, there's more people like me, and we have more ways of reaching people directly. And there's also more ways that we can help you reach people directly. So I want to start with a few uh, stats that uh, may scare, surprise, or not shock you about what does the public actually know about science? And who are we really talking to? And when we say we're talking to the public. Um, so there are many different uh, surveys and polls, a lot of them trying to figure out whether people understand scientific concepts or uh, understand scientific vocabulary or whether they trust things that scientists tell them or that they hear on the news about science. And some of these stats, 56%, and this is 2014, said, yeah, it's okay to work and do research in animals. And you know, we all know that animal research is vital to advance in human health and, and, and animal health. Uh, so this idea that we have a big disconnect between what the public appreciates about how things move forward and what we in the community of science know. Uh, similarly, so that was an NSF, um, Science and Engin Engineering Indicators. The Associated Press did a poll, it's kind of neat because it's by a news organization, trying to see what people are confident in their knowledge about or not so confident. And the one that stands out to me, which I think people are familiar with, is the idea of childhood vaccines being safe and effective. And 53% are extremely but that is true. That should scare all of us, obviously. And that doubt that you see reflected in that was sown by misinformation being spread through the news media and online by people who had an agenda or who were playing out being uh, malicious. And the idea of how quickly public trust in a crucial public health measure can crumble because of the lack of grounding in and, and lack of trust in the scientific endeavor uh, is, is very concerning to me. So what we also know that gives me some hope is that people are hungry for science news and health news and they're getting it through the internet and they're getting it through social media and they love the stuff that they see and NASA is a master of this. They, every moonshot, every Thing that they do every satellite that goes up there's live feeds there's tweets there's snapchat there's everything i happen to have gone to college with somebody who is in their pr uh, world and and i envy her every day because of the resources they have but this idea of how do we captivate people in ways that that are uh where they're going for information facebook twitter etc uh reddit and find ways to get information to them because they're craving it. And frankly, the news media are giving them, it to them less and less because the news media's business model is, is, is crumbling because of the way people have moved to social media and online communication. People aren't selling as many newspapers anymore. And the idea of having reporters who can specialize in health and science is getting rarer and rarer. Um, so this idea of how do we leverage this interest, this, this craving for science, and this understanding that science is important uh, with what we're doing. How do we also 
make sure that we are uh, helping those who make the policies that govern our country and govern the funding of science, for example, and overseeing um, institutions like ours at a state level, uh, how do we help them not see us as just a place that has controversies and safety problems and, and, and waste money on research they think is frivolous and, and actually understand the benefit of what we do. And so this idea of communicating to those who are in power, who are basically members of the public, their staff, who are writing the policies are probably not haven't had a science class since you know sophomore year of college because they're political science majors probably. So we, how do we help them uh, make sure that they understand what we're doing and what value we can bring and 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 tap the expertise of these institutions like we have. So that's another aspect of public engagement that I want to talk about. But don't take it from me. Uh, there's just a report that came out from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, which cares deeply about um, science literacy and the public perception of science. And their, their uh, committee just came out with this idea of uh, what is uh, the current state of knowledge about how uh, we should be understanding scientific literacy and what are the consequences of scientific literacy. And this is a two slide thing that I'll let you read for yourself. But I bolded the part that's bold because I think it's very important for all of you. So that we have a partial responsibility as a scientific community to create an environment in which science literacy can thrive. I'll go on to the rest of this quote. This is from the uh, overview, the introduction to the report, but I invite you to read the entire report. So this idea that we need to have a society that's infused with science literacy, not just memorizing facts, but understanding that science can be trusted, that this conduct is rare, and that we need to have uh, a society that can uh, enable science literacy rather than prevent it. So how do we have the facts resistant humans that Joe referred to uh, become an endangered species. So the team that I represent here is this is the health system team. We all cover different topics and uh, most of them are more focused on um, the clinical world than I. I have the luxury of, of mainly dealing with the research and education world, but all of my colleagues uh, deal with research uh, as well and cover different topics. Um, I formerly held the position now held by Mary Masson, and that's overseeing sort of the media relations aspect of things and the hot button issues and the crisis stuff, um, stuff that we want to not have reached the public uh, <laughs> or manage how it reaches the public. Most of what we do, though, is finding and telling positive, interesting stories about what's going on in our research labs, our hospitals, our clinics, and our education classrooms and programs. So in your packets, there's this cartoon. I won't go through it, but basically the idea is we have a, a sort of, of a routine that we typically are going through when we're finding and telling a story. And I want to talk about how you can help us do that. It's it is a it's a, it's a two-way channel. We can't know everything that's going on here. We rely on people to send us an email and say, "Hey, this is happening," or "This is coming up," or "I just got word about this." Are you interested? Could this be a story? And we won't always say yes. But we, if we don't even tell us, we won't know whether it's a story for us or not. But we also help plan what is the best communications course? What is it we're trying to achieve? Do we just want to get a story out? Are we trying to get people to do something? Are we trying to prevent people from thinking something that they are mistakenly thinking? Uh, is there a topic in the news right now that we have expertise on that we can offer that to the world in a timely way? And, and, and so that's a lot of what we do. And like I said, we also handle hot button issues, et cetera. So if there is a situation where a reporter contacts you directly or where you get word that something regulatory is happening and you want to make sure we know. And we have lots of ways of knowing what's going on that could become a, a public story that we need to help manage, but we always appreciate tips. Um, and we are the point uh, group for media uh, relations and for reporters to call. There's a similar group on main campus that covers all the rest of the university. The, it's called Michigan News. Uh, formerly known as the News Service, and there are folks there who cover the School of Public Health, School of Nursing, School of Dentistry, et cetera. So if there's any folks here from those areas, you have an analogous group in your uh, world. So the traditional way of connecting by the media, which everybody sort of thinks, oh, how do we get in the New York Times? How do we get on the you know, uh, Washington Post? So that absolutely is still happening. Those publications still have people covering science and medicine. And often they're looking for stories and ideas but often they're they're um, they're they're plowing around on the internet, finding their experts on their own, the top tier media. We help them certainly, but we also help push out stories to the middle tier and lower tier media as well, because we think there's many different ways to reach people. Uh, so when we say, you know what, the person from the uh, Livonia Observer is interested in covering your story, 
great. You at least reach people in Western Wayne County. Okay, it's not the New York Times, but it's still something. But we deal with media on all levels, basically. Um, so reporters certainly are always, uh, you know, interested and curious to find out who can comment on what, who's doing interesting stuff, and most importantly, is it timely? So if you do find yourself in a situation where we're saying, hey, I have a reporter who wants to talk with you, either because we've put something out and they've reacted or because they've come to you and want your expertise, there's a few key things, which is to prepare and have your key points ahead of time. Know what you want to get across and what you uh, uh, want them to know about the topic. Make sure that you're speaking to them in layperson's terms or that if you have to use jargon, that you explain it because they're not going to be able to use jargon in their story. Um, certainly, whatever we create, whether it's a press release or a blog post or a video, you can lean on that. You know, what we produce as a university, you can use, and frankly, you can repeat verbatim. As long as it's coming out of your mouth, the reporter can use it. Um, they don't like to rehash press releases, but they'll use it if it's coming out of your mouth. A lot of them, and I have on the respect deadlines, basically deadlines are constant for reporters. They're all trying to turn around many stories, often in a day, depending on where they're from. If they're, if they're a TV reporter, they get their assignment at 10 a.m. and it's got to be on the air at five and they have to have two experts and they have to drive to Ann Arbor and back. And it's, it, you can imagine that compresses the time scale for writing and filming and talking and, and doing an interview. So it's, a lot of times they're going to be on tight deadlines and we'll convey those to you. But if we don't respect our deadlines, we could lose the opportunity to be in that media um, opportunity. So the idea that uh, the fastest institution to the trigger when a reporter emails saying, I'm an expert on this, they're probably calling and emailing five or 10 different institutions and whichever one delivers fast wins the prize of getting quoted. That's not fair. You would hope that they would go for the best expert, the one most cited in the literature, the one with the biggest brass. But no, it's probably whoever had the fastest PR person who knew how to get a hold of that scientist in their lab or on their cell phone. Uh, so the idea of understanding who you're speaking to, a reporter for the Livonia Observer has very different needs from a reporter for Time Magazine or CNN, but we can help you think through what those are and ultimately respect their independence. I work for you, my colleagues and I all are part of the university. You can trust us with information, you can share with us, but once we get, put you in touch with a reporter, they are acting on behalf of the public. It is not that you need to mistrust them, it's just you need to understand that and say, I'm not going to be able to tell this person what to write. I will not get to see what this reporter is going to write unless they are willing to read my quotes back to me, which most will. Um, they are the, the wall between the, the, the journalistic world and the academic world you would think would be friendly, right? Because, you know, we're, we're all acting in the public interest, but even when it comes to academics, they feel like they represent the public and that they need to uh, make sure that they retain that independence so that they can represent the public. So that just means understanding that what you say can be quoted directly and that you need to be ready uh, for questions that might come up. If there's something sensitive, Think through with your PR person ahead of time what that is and be ready for it. The other thing we do uh, to be ready is a lot of times we're using what we call the embargo system. So journals, professional society meetings, uh, major national academy reports, things like that, you'll know that something's coming up. And if you let us know that something's coming up, we actually have a system that reporters who have agreed to be trusted with that information for a few days before publication we can actually work with them and reach out to them and say, hey, this is going to be coming out in three days. Here's some information. Would you like to speak with the expert? And we do this every week because it helps them, frankly, know what's coming and plan and convince their editors that they, have, they should be given time to do this article or to make graphics or to make videos. And the idea is, is widely accepted uh, by a number of journals and professional societies it all comes down to trust and it all comes down to consequences. So reporters who break embargoes, who actually uh, publish a story ahead of time, ahead of the 10 a.m. Tuesday exact date and time that it's specified by the journal, they will no longer get access to that embargo content. They'll be blackballed. And so the idea of that trust system, there are many uh, who criticize it and say this is picking and choosing what gets uh, covered. But I'll tell you, that's how probably half of the health stories you hear on NPR are getting on the air. So the idea, oh, I just found the typo. Um, the idea of, of, of making sure that we have time and that they have time comes down to you letting us know when you have something coming. And um, that is, you know, our bread and butter, frankly. But 
The other part of the bread and butter is that we have this new era where everyone has a bullhorn and everyone's a publisher and everyone can communicate. And that we as a big institution with great brand recognition at Block M, the best recognized brand anywhere, uh, we become a news source. We become a place that could be a publisher. And so this is a little joking. I, I, I obviously love reporters. I work with them every day. I actually do still need them, but it, their importance in society has eroded to some extent. However, a lot of what you see shared on Facebook and Twitter uh, was either written by an institutional communicator or a reporter who are trying to do the right thing. Um, there is a lot of junk out there. And I would argue the more good stuff we can put out helps counteract the junk being put out by people who are trying to just do more ad clicks. Um, so the idea of the social media world, the Google search world, uh, the Reddit world is that everything needs some visuals to catch their eye or a little video that can be shared as a snippet. Um, and it's and it's certainly the idea of having it be in lay, layperson's language and also reacting quickly. So when Hillary Clinton got, it divulged that she had pneumonia, by that afternoon you had the pneumonia explainers on every media outlet and every Facebook page in America. And I wrote one of them. You know, <laughs> I'm not proud. But the idea is that through by doing that and capitalizing on that news cycle uh, within the social media world. Uh, but let's say we had a controversy here. Let's say someone was criticizing us for something. Um, or heck, I mean, on a daily basis, people tweet at us saying, I'm not happy with this about my chair at the hospital. And we have to deal with that quickly because their expectation is that we are there and we are listening. So it's a two-way street. Uh, and so we have people who monitor that and to say, you know what, let me, let me, Let's take this private uh, private message on Twitter, and we're going to figure this out for you. So it's just like when you're tweeting at Delta. If you use Twitter, you can tweet at Delta and say, Delta, where's my bag? Here's the bag tag number. And they'll get right back at you because they've hired a bunch of people to be their social media people. So we're trying to do the same thing. Um, and if it becomes a big controversy, uh, you have to be even more prepared. So basically what we have done over the last decade or so is create a whole bunch of ways of creating and delivering content to many different platforms, often repurposing the same piece of content across those platforms. So when you see an article in Medicine at Michigan, it may have stemmed from something we wrote. And when you see something that a reporter has done, it may have stemmed from something we put together. Uh, when you see a Facebook post that your friend shares, it may have stemmed from that. The idea of infinitely shareable, infinitely reproducible, because it's all under U of M's open copyright. And the most recent example of that, which we debuted in March, is the Michigan Health Lab site. And I hope you've uh, visited it, but if you haven't, uh, there's a flyer in your packet. Um, so we've always had a blog site, not always, last four or five years, had a blog site that was more aimed at patients, sort of saying, here's some great tips, here's a carrot soup recipe, here's a cancer nurse talking about you know, common uh, concerns for people who want chemotherapy. Great, we still have that. It's called Michigan Health Blog. And we are feeding stories there every day as well. But what's new since March is that we have a platform for research and education stories that we are putting together every day, a new story, some days, uh, two stories that are um, written by staff, created with faculty and, and, and senior trainees and, and posted and pushed out uh, via many mechanisms. And it's often the same story we're also presenting to reporters, it's packaged slightly differently. So the screenshot I grabbed this morning kind of shows you uh, we're trying to do something that looks like a news organization, basically. And we're always looking for story ideas. And the idea is that, you know, we want to make something that looks professional, looks, you know, branded as Michigan, but not overly branded. The idea is that it, it will be, it, when you share these stories, it doesn't scream Michigan so that every Ohio State fan sucks down and doesn't read it. Um, we want it to just be something that, that is interesting, that the headline will appeal, that the, the graphic will go, oh, that's cool, click that. And so this idea of how do we make the site and bring people through the site and suggest other stories to them that are on that same topic. Or maybe they want to get an email every week of a digest of five or six stories from that week. So the idea of, of this platform, um, what they call content journalism in my field, Whatever. It's a place you can put stories that makes it look good and is easily shareable on social media. So I would love ideas from all of you about how we can do that. But the other part of this presentation real quick is the idea that all of you can and should be thinking about how you can engage directly as individuals in science and medicine. And that is using tools that are out there like Twitter, LinkedIn, Doximity, <coughs> ResearchGate, etc. Because I think that it's become easier for us, but it's also easier for you. And Packet has lots more tips and more of the sessions in this series will have more um, hands-on training. But the idea is that there is a way to be present on these platforms 
as a professional and retain that professionalism. It's not about Facebook and the high school reunion that's going on there. It's about how can you be a scientific professional on these platforms and also uh, amplify what the professionals, you know, communicators are doing on your behalf. So if nothing else, I want you to go away from this saying, you know what, I'm going to look myself up on the web. I'm going to look at my bio that's on the web. I'm gonna make sure it's good. Because how can someone find you and know what your expertise is and find that you could be helpful to them as a policymaker or a reporter or whatever, if you have a lousy web bio? So take a little time, work with your web person to say, I want a better picture. I want uh, a layperson summary that I will write. You know, and there's some tips in your pack about how to write a layperson summary about uh, write for the public. And then um, get that up on the web because the more Googleable you are, the more reachable you will be to those who need your expertise when they need it. Similarly, your LinkedIn profile. Put some time into that. Don't just list the job you had. List things that you've worked on. List topics and grants that you've been on. List papers that you published. Um, set up a Google news, a Google name alert for yourself. Search for your name in quotation marks. Maybe add a description like Michigan if you have a common name. And then set up an alert so that every day or week when somebody mentions that name online, you'll get an email. And you can see whether you're turning up somewhere. All right, so you want to take it to the next level. I would highly advise Twitter uh, because there is an incredible uh, uh, font of academics on Twitter, and there's probably a few of them in the room. Anyone here on Twitter? Excellent. So I think the idea of using Twitter as a professional, whether it's just going to meetings and following what's going on at that meeting, uh, or sharing links to your own work, or commenting on things and having tweet chats back and forth with people. Um, the idea is that it's a giant public conversation and, and you can have uh, a, a great reach with very minimal effort. I, you can also now on LinkedIn uh, write actual blog posts. It's like having your own personal blog platform without having to build anything. So LinkedIn, when you go to LinkedIn and it says share something, that's like you could paste in a link to a New York Times article and say, hey, this is cool. Or you can write a post and, and it has all this great professional editor stuff. You can put a picture, headline. You can write one paragraph and say, I just published a new paper on X in the journal Y. Here's a link to it. Click, post it. You have now published something. Congratulations. And people can see it because LinkedIn is a highly Google visible uh, platform. And your connections on LinkedIn will we'll get a, a little heads up. Again, this idea of giving us a heads up on what you're doing. And I would challenge you that once you have that great web profile of yourself, there's probably space under it that you could say, you know what, I'm gonna add a little lay summary of every paper I publish. Let's just write three lines. Today we probably have published this paper showing XYZ. This is important because our future plans are this. Click, done. It's not hard, it's just you have to say it's worth it. And it is. Okay, good. so you could just like lurk. You could just sort of be out there taking advantage and sucking it all in. Um, you can, you know, join some LinkedIn groups and see what people are saying, uh, or you can engage you know, with the card. Uh, the idea of, of not only sharing your own work, but sharing the work of others, being a person who passes cool stuff along, building that trust, building that name uh, recognition. Um, the idea of having uh, your slide sets as you present at conferences, LinkedIn has now basically bought SlideShare, and so you can post your entire slide set or a subset of it uh, to the LinkedIn SlideShare platform, and people can copy and paste and, and comment on and like and share your slides. That may seem weird, why would I want to do that? But that's how knowledge spreads, right? And if it's not something that you're waiting to publish and don't want online, then why not? Um, and the idea is that they will cite you and it'll be, you know, <coughs> it'll be clipped as from your presentation. <coughs> the other thing is if you are on Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram as a person, as a private person, be that voice for science, be that voice for reliable information and counteract the junk that people are probably seeing on their feeds from people who are don't know any better. Uh, and, and, and be that person who shares interesting observations. When somebody says X, Y, Z about climate change, you know what, stand up. We know that it's real. So be that person, I would encourage you. The other thing that I would encourage you to look at is this website called The Conversation. So this started in Australia a few years ago. It is a, a now in the US um, and several other countries. Uh, and the idea is that it is a platform that is run by journalists who work with academics, and that could be senior trainees as well as faculty and even uh, professional staff, uh, who can um, basically take a topic that's relevant to your expertise, preferably something that's timely, 
uh, whether it's time because you're publishing or someone else is publishing or a government agency just did something or a report came out, whatever the time in this element of it is, the idea of, of working with these editors and the onus is on you to do the first draft, but then they will work with you to hone that and make that something that can be actually appealing to a public audience. And they will then publish it if they like it and if they bought you know, if they like your pitch, uh, they will publish it on a platform that then they work to share those pieces with actual news organizations, the old school news organizations, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post, because those places are hungry, hungry for credible content, credible content. And you know, even IFL Science will pick up these stories. I love IFL Science. Who else loves IFL Science? If you don't know about it, IFL Science, it's awesome. Um, I won't tell you what IFL stands for. Uh, <laughs> not because it's being recorded. The idea is that the conversation becomes both a way to get into those media outlets that it, where it's your voice, um, but also a way to share things online in a way that's more commentary, more opinion, or more observation, as opposed to you know we publish this and we claim this. It's how do you pull things together about a topic? How do you say, well, we just published this or this report came out. But here's five other links you should know about from the literature of the last five years. Or uh, this is a controversial topic. It's not as clear as that someone have you believe. Those kinds of things. So it's a great platform for that. And you get to see the data about how many times it's being seen and shared. Um, so basically, my argument to you is that if you do all this, some of this, or a bit of this, that you can help reach new audiences, have more impact, connect with people who wouldn't otherwise connect with you and uh, get more out of the time that you're spending on your work, frankly. And you go, okay, Kara, sure, whatever, but what do I have to be worried about? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about this. Well, certainly, you know, <coughs> be careful when patients are involved. And I don't know how many of you have patients, um, or even if you publish something in a basic science context, but people with that condition see that and go, I've got this condition, when can I get the thing you just discovered in my medicine cabinet? And you say, mm, 10 years. Um, you know, so this idea of, of being careful and will help you if, if someone does contact you with that, because crafting a good answer that doesn't crush their dreams and sends them the credible information, uh, but is realistic, uh, is important. Um, obviously, if you want to get super political and you're ready for that, great, but it's very easy to not. And to be, so the climate change example, you might say, oh, it's too political. But you can say, you know what, I'm just going to point you to a reputable source from the Department of Energy or EPA or um, the World Health Organization and just say, you know what, here's the other side of that question. Uh, and you're not necessarily taking a, a strong stand and saying, you're an idiot. Um, you're just saying, here's some good information I'd encourage you to read. Um, uh, certainly with the presidential election coming up, it's great to, you know, if you do want to engage on advocating for a candidate uh, or a position, you should be doing that as an individual. There's a great guideline online about that. Um, the other thing I'll say is if you do want to get into a debate, either with a scientist or, uh, you know, with people or a discussion even, uh, just make sure you understand the mechanics of the platform. Don't try and have a Twitter debate if you don't know the difference between reply and retweet. Just, you know, know how to work it before you start going <laughs> ballistic on somebody. <laughs> and I just basically uh, end with a challenge to, to speak everybody else's language and, and, and don't just hope that somebody else is going to do it. Yeah, I'm here to do it. I, but I can't do it without all of you and without ideas coming in from people. And the idea that this is now, I think, like Bill mentioned, the many part of people's careers, that you will be evaluated partly on how often your work is spread and shared. Um, and that these mechanisms are ways to do that. So I have some resources. Um, these are mostly linked from either some of the, well, the slides will be available. Um, and I will give a little heads up that Joyce Lee has a talk as part of this series coming up. She's fabulous. She's a physician uh, who has really embraced social media as a way of engaging with the world. And I think if you can come to her presentation, that'd be great. And I will do a little hands-on workshop after that with the real hands-on, if you're not sure about this whole Twitter thing, to walk you through it. Uh, some more resources from our own um, uh, institutions. So these are some websites I've put together that are behind the firewall. Uh, again, these are easy to find. And I would just love ideas, but first I'd love questions or comments. Mm -hmm. so. How are we on time? Okay. okay, great. So, thoughts, reactions? How could the, for example, like the blog and everything could be translated to other languages or something like so that? So we do, actually, it's a great question. So the university has um, several staff who are actually in the main news office, but who work with us as well, who do translations of selected articles. So three of my most recent ones have been translated into Spanish. There's a Portuguese translator and there's a Chinese uh, Mandarin uh, translator. So. It's a it's a it's an inroad. It's not and Hindi. Sorry, we have Hindi as well. 
Um, so selected articles are already getting tra uh, translated. And because, yeah, the global audience wants this as well, for sure. So, and, and we'd love for those who are bilingual or trilingual or whatever to help <laughs> us yourself. If you think you could translate something we've written, you know, and, and put it, yeah, that'd be great too. So, yeah. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned alternative metrics are gaining traction. Can you elaborate a little bit? Sure. So, if you go to a lot of different journal sites and you click on a paper, you'll see a little sort of rainbow swirly thing. Um, they call it a donut. A donut, yeah. they call it? Okay, I like swirly things. <laughs> okay. um, it's, it's called Altmetrics. I, it's a company, correct? That has basically said, we think we can measure the impact of any given piece of research based on its DOI uh, on the world, based on how often it's getting uh, shared on Twitter, on uh, and other platforms that have open access to the to back end. Um, that you know, people have published blogs about it, people have published news articles that link to it. So it is a, a, an interesting, um, I would still say almost experiment. I think it's gaining traction. I will fault it though, because it does not track things that do not include the DOI. And so then most news coverage never would you know, link to or include the DOI. So the idea that you would have a way of, uh, and I think they're perfecting it, I think they're looking at ways to say, how do we otherwise say, yes, that is about this piece of research and say, so then they build a number, there's a formula. And they say, well, this was, tweeted seven times by people with this many followers, we're gonna give it a seven or whatever. And then your number goes up based on impact. So, and then they say, your altmetric score for this paper is in the top 5% for this journal and you get all excited and then you go, yeah, that's not a big deal because <laughs> then, you know. But, but the idea of having, um, you know, a way of, of starting to measure impact beyond the traditional citation uh, world, world is, is what we're talking about. So I would encourage you to check it out. Yeah. So this might be a longer question, but just if you could give us a brief answer to it. So I use Twitter, but like I have no idea what like Reddit, and I've heard of Instagram. Is there what are their benefits? What are they sure. Instagram is highly visual and and a little light on substance, frankly. Um, I'm not a huge fan, but you can tell. Uh, but I think it is it is a channel that people are using to share you know their everyday life. But when we share a scientific image on there. It does get some likes and shares, and we can put a link in there and say, if you want to know what this image is about, great. So highly visual things work well on Instagram. The other thing that works well is we're trying to use it to reach prospective medical students, for example. So we have a whole Instagram account for prospective med students. We want to show them that if they come here and not Harvard or Yale or UC San Diego, that they can have experiences in labs, that they can have experiences outside of labs, that they can do things in a really cool clinical environment. So using Instagram to convey that to the generation that is very heavily into Instagram is a very reason. So it may not be the right channel for many messages. Um, the other one you asked about was Reddit. So Reddit is basically one of these really free for all kind of sites where you can be anonymous. So it does get into that whole question of, you know, nasty grams uh, as comments. But the idea is that within Reddit, it's, there are different pages, channels, whatever you want to call them, where people say, ah, we're going to be here over here talking about science, or we're going to be here talking about microbiome, or we're going to be here talking about uh, gram-negative bacteria. You know, you could get super granular really quickly and have a page about it. Of course, the number of people who engage are, is what makes it successful or not. So the, the new Reddit Journal of Science page, for example, is just a place where people just share links and say, huh, this is kind of cool. And other people go, yeah, I already forgot to do that, or that's really neat. I'm going to share that onward, and you can vote for it, or you can just take that link and share it somewhere else. So it's a place to converge, it's a place to find and discover. They do this thing called Ask Me Anythings, where the, the Reddit administration, such as they are, it's a very small operation, um, will say, at this time on this date, we will uh, take questions from the world, any Reddit user, which could be anyone, uh, and we will pose them to this, these experts who have done something interesting, or these celebrities, uh, or these whatever. And so the idea is that it's a way to have a virtual conversation uh, and so you could be selective about which questions you answer, uh, but and, and they'll often give you a few hours to sort of see the questions that are coming in, and then you'll say, at this time, I'll go online and start answering, and then more questions can come in. Um, it's, you know, we would certainly be happy to help someone who's thinking about, you know, proposing and asking anything uh, to think about how to, how to frame that and how to get it to be most successful. We can promote it ahead of time, you know, things like that. But it lives on, online as a, as a way for, um, there to be interaction, basically, in real time, in many cases. So, yeah. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. So I'm totally on board with, cool. with what you're saying here, um, but 
do you know institutionally if there's any incentives in place for students and faculty to do this kind of engagement? So if people are spending their time doing this instead of, say, publishing or applying for more money, right. what is what is in place to say, yes, we as an institution at UMHS support? Right. I think that is a watch this space question. So I think the, the, the question is, can you carve out just enough time that you can make an impact without having it be way at your time too much where you're doing your publishing, your grant writing, your actual bench work? Um, and I think I would argue that you can. I frankly use Twitter when I'm in line at the grocery store to monitor what's going on. I'm, I'm not writing at that point. I was never going to be writing when I'm in line at the grocery store, but I can check Twitter and maybe share a link or something like that. So if you can carve out ways to do it in those interstitial moments, that's that's one thing to think about. I think that there is a growing sense, and President Schlissel has voiced that that sense that we need to be a public and engaged university uh, because we are a public university and because we have this knowledge that that society can use. Um, so I think that that is something that how any given school or college implements that for faculty promotion or tenure decision or uh, evaluation of, of of students and staff. Um, you know, I think, and if there's anyone here who wants to speak to how it's being, you know, talked about in your department, I welcome that because I'm not for those discussions often. But I would say, yeah. I, I just want to say that I think they are starting to look at that, uh, especially uh, in PT discussions, promotion and tenure discussions that I've been privy to. But um, in your evaluations, uh, give yourself a chance to justify that. Uh, if you know, being a publicly publicly engaged university is one of our missions, then certainly uh, it justifies spending time doing those activities. And I will say that funding agencies are starting to appreciate it. And I think I, when I see uh, uh, someone send the press release back to their program uh, officer at the funding agency, and and actually the NIH press office shares it, or Francis Collins mentions it in his blog. I mean. There you go. What greater you know signal do you need? But is it going to make or break your tenure case? Probably not, and it never will, and it never should. But it should be factored in, and 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 time should be allowed for it. Yeah. From my own experience, I see it as a tool to help my career, rather than kind of the end. Yeah. Yeah. So like, Kara helped us with the press release for a paper that I only did the press release because I wanted to write it for post that. Yeah. Because that helped his career just to have his name out the ether. And I've had. Several papers, I've had a couple papers published because of collaborations. Yeah, that's a great point. So, the idea of connecting with people in new ways, leading to new collaborations that then enhances your work or then leads to new ideas. And I would also just add that yeah. when, I find other papers by reading Ed Young or other science writers. Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to do a PubMed search for this topic, but if I see something that would be attracted there, yeah. I'm going to find it. So, yeah. So there's probably at least half a dozen or a dozen different sites you could potentially connect on, mm -hmm. but you can't really use a dozen simultaneously. Right. So how, how should we be prioritizing where we want to go? So you're saying as an individual, basically? Or as the lab. Or as a lab, okay. So certainly I will um stand here and say that if you're thinking about creating a facebook page or group for your lab stop don't please uh, i'm not going to say you can't i can't say you can't you can't but i'm going to say that the way facebook and even twitter works is that they help um uh get things out by um algorithms that show they present things to to, to routine users uh based on the power of the channel it's coming from so facebook especially not as much as um, Twitter. Twitter is there's page certainly, but so Facebook, our health system Facebook page, our med school Facebook page have thousands and thousands of followers, and even we have to pay to reach all of their eyeballs with any given post, uh, and we have started to pay more for, for learning some posts. So even with those thousands and thousands of followers, any given post is only going to reach a few, you know, a, a, a 10, 15, 20 percent of those folks. So if you create a Facebook page for your lab or for your group or for your even department and you're struggling to get to 100 and some odd followers, and you put out a post that's seen by 10, 10 people, what have you actually achieved? So it would be better to think about how can you engage with us to say, we're doing this event, we need people from around the country to know we're doing this event. Um, here's you know the website, here's the registration form, help us promote that. Here's $15 to promote a Facebook post on the Med School Facebook page, and we'll, and we'll promote that for you. 
and so leveraging that existing platform. So I, I think we've built many platforms as a health system, as a med school, and as a university, talk about powerhouse brand on social media, where we can help you know, use those to get the messages of the community out in a selective way. You as an individual, um, I actually, I think that if you are a physician claiming your doximity ID and at least um, having your presence there be uh, robust is good, and similarly research gate, uh, you know, making sure that your, your presence there is good. I also, though, advocate for LinkedIn. Doximity is behind a giant firewall, so people can't see it unless they are physicians or, in some cases, med students. Um, research gate's a bit more open, uh, and, and, and LinkedIn is wide open. Their whole business model is built about built on searchability. So making sure you at least tend your LinkedIn profile twice a year at the, at the most, you know, at the least, I should say, um, would be great. If, thinking about Instagram as a, an individual, think about that as personal use. Think about it as connecting with you know, coworkers and, and lost, long lost college buddies. Um, and Facebook the same way. Um, Snapchat, I don't know what to do with. Um, <laughs> I tried the other day, it didn't go well. Um, but, and then and then Twitter, I think that even being a lurker on Twitter, you have to make sure you put your photo up there, written a little bio so that people can find you. And even if you're doing nothing other than going on it and like um, he said, saying, you know, who's publishing interesting stuff, who's saying something interesting, if that's all you're doing on Twitter, you're still getting something out of Twitter. But the two-way street that is Twitter uh, is very valuable too. So I'm an advocate for Twitter. I don't know how robust their business model is and how much longer they'll be with us, but for now, let's let's, let's play along. <laughs> so. Yeah. One of the things I've been impressed by on Twitter is how many people who have experimental ideas about openness or about um, sharing of science yeah. are on Twitter. Yes. Like people are promoting preprints, which yes. I think are very interesting. Yes. Are there things that we are doing as a university to change the game instead of just playing it well, to change how people interact, uh, how they share, how we share our science, are there things that we're trying to do to kind of innovate? So I will say that at IHPI, where I spend a lot of my time, I'm running monthly Twitter workshops to help faculty and senior trainees um, actually uh, learn the ropes with Twitter and use it. I'd love to do that in other areas too, or across the med school, and certainly one of the workshops coming up uh, in this series will be that. So I think first and foremost, helping those who are tentative or just don't understand the power of it to, to engage. Are we thinking about new? So certainly, you know, are we? Uh, I think the M Open uh, folks in the Open University courses that people are designing. How can we get those out more? I think is a challenge. Similarly, using it for finding uh, clinical trial participants is is a huge untapped frontier, and and that's going to require paid promotion of posts because people are not going to you know resonate to those posts. But getting it in front of them. So I'm promoting a study right now that needs 550 nine and ten year olds whose parents are willing to enroll them in a brain study. For probably in the next five or seven years, right? We're not telling them we need them for that long, but we will. Um, and the idea of, of how do you find parents of nine and ten year olds? They have to be in certain school districts within 25 miles of Ann Arbor, and we don't want them all to call at once. So the idea of how do you make a paid social media campaign that every month or so puts out another post saying, We want your kid's brain, and you know, and here's what's in it for you, three hundred dollars a year. Uh, is and, 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 and that we can do this within IRB regulations um, so that we're not coercing or, or, or um, with, with the financial promise or any promise of benefit. So this idea of how do we use social media to achieve a main aim of this institution, which is to fill clinical trials because we've gotten funding for them that will be lost if we don't fill the trial, um, is a crucial, a crucial goal. Yeah, I'd love to learn more about that. And I think that is very innovative. And Many people might take back on that. I think mean, trials is very hard. Great. To do. Excellent. Now, I think that when, you know, with the clinical trials overhaul that's going on now, I think that we, from the start, said communications and funding for better communications will need to be part of this overhaul. There was so much else to be done first, <laughs> but I think they're getting there. And there's already a Facebook page um, that called um, Michigan Health Research. That is the old Mishar Facebook page. And so they basically rebranded it. And now that's going to be the platform for doing promoted posts aimed at recruiting people for trials. So love Oh, but you can also push it to the social media platform with more eyes on it. Exactly. That's the whole idea is that, that they're already there and Facebook lets you target them because heck it lets you you know let's people target you for selling you shoes uh, based on what your Google searches were. So let's use those Facebook tools and, and be their 
business model, uh, to get the parents of nine and ten year olds whose you know brains we can scan. That's very interesting. Yeah. Great. Other thoughts and observations or worries? Yeah. Uh, about the Snapchat, I just I was just thinking about it. It's just that I I follow a lot of physicians on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. and was, yes, they actually do use that a lot. They have like this. Well, obviously they tell the patients, but you can see actually the surgeries that they're performing and everything, mostly plastic surgeons. The good thing is that maybe can be used, for example, like Research Palooza. Yeah. So you can just right. like start recording and like, because it has like the location and everything, so yeah. you can just start putting it on when the activities are happening. You can like when, yeah. maybe the day before, like people, what they do, you can, uh, they have like this Promoted. thing called memories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can make like, for example, uh, a poster thing or something and just upload it to Snapchat right. and then people will get it and you can put it on the page and, and it's really easy. For example, like the activities they do at Mots, yep. they can do the same Absolutely. thing and kids love that. They like do. my, my sister is in love with that's Snapchat. That's where she's at, right? Yes, yeah. I have like 30, um, <laughs> 25, 20. Um, so, so I don't personally use Snapchat, but the university has a very active Snapchat presence. And actually every week uh, we're trying to have at least uh, one uh, U of M sort of story. And so basically the other night, there was a med student who was trying out for the Life Sciences Orchestra, and she did a Snapchat story about the process of trying out and who was there, and then here's a cool guy playing, you know, his clarinet to warm up. And so it was a way of bringing somebody inside that world of the university and, and through Snapchat. And similarly, you know, my hospital has a filter. So if you Snapchat from my hospital, you just had a baby, you could put a graphic on that Snapchat that said, I have a baby. Go for it. So yeah, the university is engaging with Snapchat, trying to do it centrally and have one big U of M account. So because that that channel started after the social media infrastructure for the university uh, was solidified. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, a lot of accounts got made around the university and we're not shutting them down. We're trying to feed them good content. But Snapchat, they're saying, let's just go with one main University of Michigan Snapchat. They have actually a thing, it's called University of Michigan Stories. And, yeah. it, and it happens yes. like in a while and you can, everyone oh, can yeah. just upload yeah. their thing. And, and then similarly on Twitter, there's every uh, once in a while, you'll see a Umich chat. So there's a hashtag, which on Twitter is a way to connect tweets across a topic. And so somebody will be sitting there in a talk, live tweeting out, and including that hashtag, Umich chat or Umich talk, I forget which which is, is uh, in every tweet. So that somebody in Zimbabwe can be following that talk at the University of Michigan live or go look at it later. And so this idea of using that power of live tweeting to capture events and live Snapchatting or Facebook Live. I Facebook Live the white coat ceremony this year when the incoming med students got their white coats. I just set my phone on the edge of the stage and pressed broadcast and Facebook beamed that up to the world and thousands and thousands of people were able to join in the white coat ceremony. It's amazing what you can do. So, yeah. Does the, um, the health system communications use any like social media management, like Hootsuite? Or yes, like that? we're actually in the process of changing, um, uh, but basically, yes. Yeah, so we have a, a way for us to all schedule tweets and plan ahead and, and think together about how to leverage this throughout the day, what's going on. So is anybody inspired to go out there and contact the conversation or start a Twitter account or at least update your web? Profile based on this. <laughs> I hope. I hope. Yeah. I was doing a great thing, but like Google Scholar is really easy to do. Yes. There's a lot of these things. So we also have this ridiculous MCD thing. Is there ever a possibility that we could have one? What, one way of tracking because all of your publications? CD, which is private to your them. We spend a lot of time uploading, uploading things. Formatting. Yeah. That's a little outside my scope, but yeah. I think that Jill is yeah, you know yeah, about that. So, um, Come on up, Jill. Michigan <laughs> Experts is what we have right now. And um, it is it migrated to a new platform back in April, and it's been a bumpy migration. Uh, but that's where uh, research faculty have their profiles uh, that have your publications. It lists your University of Michigan, any grant funding that you get. Um, external grant funding um, in our that's in our databases, patents, and things like that. Um, we are looking at maybe moving from that vendor, so uh, because the migration has been so bumpy. But so we are looking at uh, profiling systems that would capture that all in one place, and that has the capabilities then of uh, you being able to export that information to other places. Well, and there's something called Orchid. Oh, I see. I yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. That there's like five of these. CV yeah. sites, and then U of M has to have their own. 
the med school has, yes, yeah. yes, uh, MCV, I guess is the one that's for the med school. Um, we're not going to make our profile profiling platform on um, uh, CV functional. So you wouldn't be able to create a CV from something like experts, but all of that information you are able, you would be able to export in various uh, formats to other things. And it is going to be linked to ORCID as well. So um, we're doing the best we can to try and work with existing systems. Um, we're using existing vendors that have already worked out these kinks. So uh, hopefully things like um, ORCID and uh, Science CV and experts and all of these different things are talking to each other um, to reduce the burden. So we do recognize that faculty are getting frustrated with how many different things they have to update all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, with technology, we're just trying to, you know, iron it out as we go. Things change really quickly, as you know. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Great. Thank you. Great turnout.